In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the darkness of the cross, we see the real and living God displayed most clearly and vividly. In the darkness of the cross, we see the real and living God displayed most clearly and vividly. No other God can survive the test of the cross. In that darkness, the uncreated light of the crucified God shines. And as we read through Mark 15, we might might be more, more inclined to focus on the darkness that's happening. It might seem like the noisy confusion and chaotic, messy darkness as we read through Mark chapter 15. But as ever with Jesus, just one little statement from him, and that brings everything into its proper light so that there's clarity and order. Always with Jesus is like that. And Mark 15 verse 2, where one of the last things Jesus says in the whole book of Mark, this is one of the last things, probably just like two more things he says and that's it, but one of the last things he says in the whole book of Mark is, uh, well here, he, Pilate says to him, so Pilate, he's standing before Pilate and Pilate says, Ah, the king of the Jews, eh? And Jesus says, you said it. And Pilate's like, no, no, I didn't, I didn't say that. I was just asking. I was just asking, are you the king of the Jews? Hang on. And Jesus said, no, you said it. And the way it's phrased in this English version that we have, it's probably too strong where it says, are you the king of the Jews? Whereas it's probably more like, just like king of the Jews, king of the Jews. Mm-hmm. He's asking, Pilate's asking for clarification It's like he's saying, so who do we have here? Ah, the king of the Jews. And it's like, so you're the king of the Jews then. And Jesus is like, ah, good. You couldn't have have said it better. Jesus is deliberately hearing as a statement rather than a question what Pilate has just said. So Pilate said, king of the Jews. Jesus says, you've said it. Which is funny because all Pilate does in the chapter is ask questions, almost. He's like, he's king of the Jews, eh? Uh, Aren't you going to answer? And then he's like, aren't you going to answer these accusations they're bringing against you? Are you just going to accept these? Are you just going to stay silent? Do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? He asks the crowd. And then they're like, nah, kill him. And then he says, well, do you... Uh, They say, of course not, we want him dead. And then he says, well, what should I do with him? And they say, kill him. And he says, well, why? What crime has he committed? And they say, never mind that, just kill him. Pilate is a person who apparently just seems to be asking questions, loads of questions, but he is in fact making statements. If you take all his questions and make them into statements... Pilate stating who Jesus is, his identity, the true king, that Jesus is the innocent one, he's done nothing wrong, that Jesus is being wrongfully accused, and that everyone else apart from Jesus is responsible. What do you want done? What do you want done with him? What should I do with him? And it's as it's as if Jesus, in Mark 15 verse 2, is telling us, right, as we go through this chapter and all these events, it's going to be really dark and confusing and difficult probably to watch. But I, right at the outset, I'm going to say something here and you're good. this is going to make sense of it for you. Jesus says, listen to Pilate as he asks, as he makes these, as he asks these questions, He's not asking questions, he's making statements. And it's almost like you can just cry out all the noise and everything and just follow this. Everything Pilate says, it might, he might think it's a question, but he's really making statements about Jesus. 
Jesus is giving us a clue right away. He, sa he says, right, you said it. And he, when he says that, he's saying, as if to tell us, take everybody at face value. Everybody from now on until I die is going to be saying stuff. And it means the opposite of what they intended or more than they intended. And it's as if Jesus is speaking to the church in all generations. It's this little word to us where he just says, you said it. And listen to what he says. He's telling us, listen carefully to what everybody says. It all matters. And they don't even know what they're going to be saying. But I'm telling you, you're going to hear a lot of truth. So don't read it as a confused, chaotic, meaningless series of events where everything's going horrendously wrong and Jesus is being lost and obscured in the darkness of it all. Jesus is telling us to pay close attention to the details because in the darkness and chaos of the cross, the light shines. And so when the chief priests are coming in in verse 3 of chapter 15, and they're bringing all these accusations of sin, on one level it might seem, this is an outrage. This is an outrageous injustice. How can they say these things about Jesus? But Jesus says, no, watch. Watch carefully. Think about it. What they're doing is effectively, as they come in with all these accusations, what they're doing is effectively laying their hands on the lamb and transferring guilt onto him it's as if these are the priests who are coming in and saying you're the guilty one and Jesus is like yeah just lay it all on me just state all the sins you want and in fact the more you accuse me of the better so when they accuse him of many things it's as if he welcomes it He's like, yeah, I want to be accused of every wrong, every wrong. Give it all you've got. Throw everything you've got at me. I'll take it all on. I'll take it all on. I'll write my name under it all. And I'll say, I did that. Yeah, that was me. I did that. That one, that was me. And Pilate, it, we read he's amazed in verse 5. Because I suppose he's used to judging people. And he's, and he's like, this guy is clearly not guilty of any of this. And he's like saying to Jesus, why aren't you resisting all this? He's probably used to people objecting to accusations when they're obviously not innocent. But here these priests are bringing endless accusations against Jesus. And Pilate can see it's obvious that Jesus hasn't done anything wrong. Verse 14. He's like, what? He hasn't done any, obviously hasn't done any of these things. But Jesus is just like, he doesn't say anything. And he doesn't try to answer them. He doesn't say, no, actually, I, I didn't do that. And actually, if you look on my, in my diary on that day, I did, wasn't actually there. I was somewhere else. He doesn't do any of that. He doesn't say anything. And Peter will comment on this in his first letter, St. Peter, where he says, He's, say, he's staying silent because he's the lamb being led to the slaughter. And as a lamb before the people who are going to kill it is silent, so he's being silent now. The silence of Jesus is indicative of this. He's taking upon himself very strongly the identity of the lamb. Who in the prophets is not even allowed to speak, so Jesus keeps silent now. To show that he is the lamb. He's being inspected and judged as the lamb. To be slaughtered at this Passover time. And as a sacrifice. And Pilate is stating. That there's nothing wrong with him. He's an innocent lamb. An innocent lamb. And yet. He must die. Innocent but must die. And that's been set. Before us, right from the beginning of Mark's gospel, do you remember right back to those all those weeks ago when we looked at uh, chapter 1, when Jesus, he had no need to repent in himself, but he's the one who gets into the water with all the unclean sinners, and he allows that uncleanness to stick to him, and he repents with us and for us. He's the one 
who has no sins of his own, but is willing to take all of ours on and to deal with them. And now here's the point where he's actually going through with this. This is that point. This all be leading up to this. And he's identifying deeply as this Lamb of God who takes on himself all the sins of the world and takes them away. He's being assessed, inspected and found to be pure and faultless and then sins are placed on him. And he's delivered over to be killed as a sacrificial victim. And then, when all this is happening, we've got this Bar Abbas figure. A man called, which that Bar Abbas means son of a father. And he's been, he's, we're told he's been imprisoned with rebels who committed murder in the uprising. Verse 7. This is a person, actually, who... We know him as Bar Abbas, but he hasn't really got a proper name. <coughs> that is, Bar Abbas basically is a name that you're given if the authorities are like, what well, we don't know who he is. We've, we've arrested him. He's not telling us his right name. He keeps saying he's Mickey Mouse or Donald Duck or Bugs Bunny or whatever. <laughs> and all right, so we've got a John Doe on our hands. This is a John Doe or a Joe Bloggs, whatever. We'll call him that because we don't know his real name. We'll call him Bar Abbas because what we do know is he's a son of of somebody he's a son of somebody that's all he is a son of somebody so he's basically got a name that just stands for everybody John Doe Joe Bloggs or every man Smith and Jones whatever he's just every man bar just means born of or an Abba means a father so it's basically born of some human father like everybody everybody in this room everybody's born of some human father everybody is the son or daughter of somebody that's bar abbas he's obviously a man who symbolizes the human race anybody and everybody and it's interesting that he's a rebel involved in murder and uprising and he's incarcerated in prison that's everybody. That's everybody. That applies to everybody too. We're involved in a rebellious uprising with blood on our hands. We're all part of a rebellion against the monarch, the proper king. And we've got blood on our hands doing it. And Barabbas symbolizes any and every human being. He's the son of a father. But then... The real son of the father steps forward and this Bar Abbas, this every man who's imprisoned, gets to go free when this, the son of the father steps forward. What's interesting about that is that everyone is born of some human father except Jesus. Jesus doesn't he cannot fall under that heading of bar abbas because he doesn't have a human father and on this mother's day we can emphasize this he's born of a woman not of a man so that's a term that jesus can't have in that sense bar abbas anyone born of a human father it's like um so anyone who's born of a human father can go free now and everyone's leaving and there's just one person left standing mm -hmm. And it's this one person who says, well, I haven't got a human father. I can't go free. Yes, because he has a different father entirely. Everyone else is just born of a father, but Jesus is the son of the father. He's the bar of us with a different father entirely. And we, we're thinking, well, that's the one reason why you should go free. Everyone else is one of these rebels with blood on our hands, with uh, incarcerated. He isn't. He's the son of the father. And if anyone should go free, it should be him. And Pilate, it seems like Pilate's almost saying that. You should go free. I'm just setting up this guy so that they'll go, well, clearly this guy, he needs to be taken and killed so you can go free. But no. That's why Jesus won't go free. Because, as we sung earlier, the greatest in the kingdom is the servant of all. 
He's like, I'll be the least in the kingdom, the slave of everybody else, so everybody else can be set free. And Jesus' identity is being vividly set forth here in all the darkness of these crucifixion events. The light shines in the darkness. Nothing is meaningless or accidental. It's all got meaning. It's all revealing his identity as the one who comes in service and suffering because he is the living God whose true glory is that he dies for human beings who hate him. The glory of this living God is being revealed here. His identity is on display and it's that fascinating thing that people all around him are constantly <coughs> affirming his identity while in their minds they're denying it. And so we can, we can just take it at face value and just think, oh, if this is a mess, they're, just, they're making fun of him, they're doing all these things to him, they hate him, all that. And we can take it in that way or we can do what Jesus told us to do at the beginning when he said, you said it. We can realise that they're saying these true things about Jesus, even though they think they're, they're making fun of him. And the soldiers, they put a purple robe on him, the colour of royalty, and a crown. And they say, Hail, King of the Jews. And they fall on their knees before him. And they, they think, oh, this is making fun of him. This will show him a thing or two, but really what they're doing is doing what everyone will do one day. And they fall on their knees before him. And again, we're still seeing this. It's almost as if everything that happens, Mark's saying, notice what they're actually doing before you notice what they think they're doing. So it's like, king of the Jews, you said it. Innocent, oh yeah. They put purple robe on him, crown him, bow before him, yes. It's all correct. And they're going, no, but we meant, we meant the opposite. We, we're, just, we're just having a bit of fun. We're just making fun of him. And Mark's like, well, from where I'm standing, there's something beautiful going on here. As I watch true royalty being displayed, being acknowledged, the lamb who occupies the throne of the universe, the king who reigns from the tree. And then there's Simon of Cyrene in verse 21. The father of Alexander and Rufus, who of course show up later on in other bits of the Bible, uh, at the end of Romans and things. Of course, Jesus has said consistently, you must take up your cross and follow me. And then this guy literally does. Simon of Cyrene shows up and literally does that. Um, and it's like, you might say, oh, but no, he, he, no, Simon of Cyrene is forced to do it. So it, there's no meaning in that. There's no meaning in it. But there's meaning in everything here. Everything. And in the end, this man does, in fact, take up the cross of Jesus and follow him. And where does he follow him to? The place of death. The place of the skull. Verse 22. And Jesus had said, you must take up your cross, follow me, lose your life in order to find it. And here's someone who is literally carrying Jesus' cross to the place of death, following Jesus along that road to crucifixion. And it's as if everything that happens has these two levels. You could look at it as if they're rejecting Jesus' identity, they're mocking him. This guy's forced to carry the cross. Whereas if you go, no, actually, look at it again. They're all stating his identity. They're acknowledging him as king. They bow before him. A man who becomes one of the great church leaders of North Africa does in fact take up the cross of Jesus and follow him. All as Jesus said must happen. And then as you continue on through verse 26, he's even got this written notice. Here's the real king, the king of the Jews. And then verse 27, they crucify two rebels with him, picking up on the Bar Abbas idea. Here is the true king. And surely a, tr a king belongs on a throne. And he's the one who should be putting the rebels to death. But here he is with the rebels on either side. On this cross. The ruler with the rebels on the cross. And then verses 27 to 32. Notice the insults that they hurl at him. 
They're like, come down, save yourself. Look, you saved others, you, but you can't save yourself. And they think they're mocking him, but actually because he is saving others, therefore he can't save himself. Again, everything that's being said is telling us who Jesus is and the significance of what he's doing. They think, oh, let's have a bit of fun. You know, hey, you talked about saving other people uh, and you can't even save yourself. You're ridiculous. And they're making fun of him. But really, in saying that, they're saying what he's actually doing. He can't come down from the cross to save himself because he's determined to save others. If he does save himself, everybody else will be lost. But no, he sticks with it. Even if it means that he has to experience the horror of being of God forsaken. Something he's never known and something we could never even imagine was possible. But he goes to those lengths because he knows this is the only way. He can't come down off that cross. He must see it through. And Psalm 22 verse, uh, in chapter 15 verse 34 must have been so helpful to him to keep that perspective. And as the things that Psalm 22 talks about are playing out in front of him and around him, people mocking him, piercing his hands and feet, dividing his clothes, he must be thinking, it's, it's, all, it's all happening as the ancient scriptures said, I must stay the course. I cannot save myself, but I know that by doing this, I'll save others and I'm trusting my father to look after me and to get me through this. So then, he's got this perspective. And this one that he's tried to give us right from the outset. He's even thinking of us as he goes to the cross. He's thinking, when he says to Pilate, you said it. He's thinking of us. And here he is, giving us that perspective. Verses 35 and 36, they say, they, they deliberately mishear him then. When he's quoting Psalm 22. And they say, look, he's calling for Elijah. Let's see if Elijah takes him down from off the cross. And when we hear that, we're thinking, what? well, we know that the one thing Elijah won't do is take him down from the cross. Because we've seen Elijah recently in Mark's Gospel, haven't we? He's actually shown up. And what's he been talking about when he shows up? Well, because when, when they go, ooh, Elijah, imagine if Elijah, he rolls up and... Uh, what he's, he'll, let's see if he helps him. And then we, we're, if we're, we're thinking, yeah, well, yeah, he actually did. Elijah did show up not that long ago, a couple of, like three weeks ago, and Moses did as well. And neither one of them wanted Jesus to come down off the cross. In fact, at that time when they appeared with him on the mountain, they were encouraging him to go ahead and to get up there and to do it. And in fact, they already had a practice run. They'd already, because when Jesus is there and he's on either side of him, two people either side of him, right and left, and he's there on a mountain, and he's talking about his glory, his, his like death. And they've already had this practice run. Moses and Elijah, they're totally in on it. And they're backing him, and they're saying, no, let's get you prepared for this. Let's talk it through. And they're doing this trial run, preparing him for the cross. So yeah, Elijah might show up, but if he rolls up, he certainly was, won't going to be taking Jesus off the cross. He's not going to be doing that. So Jesus stays up there, and then we see that he stays up there until he dies. What a thought that is. That uh, This one that we've learned about all through Mark's Gospel. Who is he? The living God. The Son of Man. This, the one who made, made all things, all, and here he is, and he's dead. He stayed up there until he's died. And as he dies, they've been making fun of him about stuff he said. And they say, ah, look, he's, he, here he is. And he, look, he, he said that he would knock the temple down, rebuild it in three days. And uh, here he is, he can't even save himself. And earlier... In the week when Jesus went to the temple earlier in the week to be sacrificed in the temple, because he was expecting this is the day where it's all going to happen. Psalm 118 talks about it. 
And the people, when he arrived, he said, no, you're not coming in here. And in the end, they kill him out there, outside the camp. But actually, as soon as he dies, it seems to have an impact inside the temple, immediately, in verse 38. He's outside the camp, but inside the camp, inside the temple, it has an impact inside, even though they've killed him outside, as if his death actually is almost inside the temple. And they can't even stop that happening. And it's as if the Lord's like, well, as far as I'm concerned, it has happened in the temple. And, he, and then they're, they're saying, yeah, but you, you're doing nothing like that in here. You're not coming in here. In the temple, in fact, you're not even welcome in the temple. And Jesus is like, all right, yeah, well, whatever, we'll see. And then as soon as he dies, the temple's curtain's torn from top to bottom. As though he's, 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 what he's doing there has an impact in the temple. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine the reactions. He's actually done it in the temple. It's so, what he's doing there has impacted the temple. And it shows that even though to us all this chaos and darkness and what might seem to be, oh, this is a mess. Really what's happening, it's all showing off his glory. And he shines most brightly at the cross. And then there's this beautiful moment in verse 39 because... In verse 32, they've been saying, if you come down, right, okay, like Messiah, King of Israel, if you come down off that cross, then we'll see and believe. Uh, so if you come down now, we'll see and believe, and uh, okay, we'll trust what you've said, and we're, we're on board. But only if you come down off that cross. But Jesus has, he, when he, he stays up on the cross, he says, no. The Father's told me to do this. It's the right thing to do that only by dying this way will people see and believe. And he stays there until he dies. And was he right? Was he right to do that? Maybe he should have come down. But we see in verse 39, no, he was right to, keep, to stay there until he died. Because as soon as he dies, once he's gone the full distance and died... A God-forsaken death as the sin-bearer. Then there's this immediate confirmation from the centurion. From somebody who's a total pagan outsider who actually killed Jesus. And he sees Jesus go the full distance and die, not saving himself. And the centurion says, oh, it's all true. <clears throat> he actually is the living God. He sees how Jesus actually died and that confirms to the centurion that is God. That is God. That's the only God worth bothering with. That's authentic deity, the God who stays up on the cross, who stays up there as the Passover lamb, who actually dies. Only that confirms who the real God is so people will see and believe. No other gods can face the final ordeal of death in the end. Only one has gone down into it and emerged on the other side. As someone has written a single figure rising from the flood and filling the horizon. And then very early on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, Mark 16 verse 2. Here's Mark using very strong, because he's like, right, first day of the week, just after sunrise using very strong creation language, light from darkness. And it's on day eight, the first day of the new week, new creation. But there's very, but that, so we should be thinking, oh, so this is going to be wonderful and people will be really in tune with what's going on because they've, uh, they've, they've listened to what Jesus said when he, when he said, right, listen to what, Everyone's saying, watch closely. They're affirming every, my identity, what I'm here to do. And they're all of the right perspective. And then when it gets to this day, when the light bursts through the darkness, and it's this first day of a new creation week, first, the eighth day of the week, it's all that. Surely we're all going to have the right perspective. But you see that the, there's this very human perspective still going on because the question they're concerned with is, we're, oh, we're going to the tomb. Who is going to ro roll the stone away from the entrance to the tomb? Who, that's the big problem. Who will roll this big stone away? This big massive stone. 
because uh, otherwise we'll never get in. And they're arriving with this question in their minds, this is the big problem we've got to face. Who's going to roll that big stone away? Whereas if they like, listened to Jesus, took him seriously, then this wouldn't have taken them by surprise. When they look up and they see the stone, which was very large, Mark admits that, but it's rolled away. It's already been rolled away, as if to say, no, your problem isn't how do we get in? You're not going to have to worry about that. Yeah, the stone's very large. There's no way you're getting in. But the thing is that you don't have to worry about how you're getting in because here, here's the thing. He's already out. He's already moved it and he's burst out. He's making his way out. He's bust out. And they're like, what? What's going on? What on earth? Because in their minds, they're just going to deal with a dead body, a dead person. Because they've still, they've still got this perspective of, oh, it's all a mess, all darkness. And they haven't taken hold of this, what Jesus was showing them. Look, this is all happening as, it was, as I said. And they're like, they're just going to deal with a dead person. But when they get there, they're told, yeah, that's not the problem that you're going to have to deal with. Because this dead person has got up and walked out and he's rolled the stone away. He's risen. Don't be alarmed. He's not here. You can go and have a look where he was. And then, uh, verse 8, Mark 16, verse 8. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. And as Paul was saying earlier, we don't, we don't stop it there. Imagine if Mark finished there. That would be terrible. But no, they are, they're, like, they're trembling and afraid for probably like 10 minutes. And then they go and tell uh, people. They go straight to Jerusalem and tell everybody. But in verse 8, they're still, they're, they're dealing with this. We were in that mindset of this is all to, like terrible darkness. And we hadn't seen Jesus clearly. And they're ex they've, they've had their little human perspective blown open. All their expectations have been changed. And perhaps they let that superficial view of chapter 15 take over that perspective where it seems like everyone's denying his identity everyone's saying if he were the real deal he would save himself but he didn't and he died and maybe he wasn't the real deal but then you read the exact same story again and the people are affirming his identity and bowing to him and worshiping him and someone does follow him and carries his cross and even though they say the only way anyone be will believe in you is if you don't die, but then he does die and someone does believe in him, it's all adding up. It's all making sense. But perhaps in chapter 16, the, way, the first way of seeing it is uppermost in their minds as they arrive. And so they arrive with the attitude, oh, we've got big problems here. How are we going to get into death to deal with the problem of death? And instead, when they get there, the picture's radically different. And it's like, no, you don't have to get into death. You don't have to get into death. He's broken out of death. And they're thinking, what? No, no, but we've got to go and deal with this dead body. And no, you don't have to. He's broken out of death. You don't have to deal with death. He's dealt with it once and for all. That's over now. And as far as you're concerned... Tombs are finished. You don't need to think about tombs again. All that's in the past now. Because this is the first day of the new creation. And he's risen. And he's got this life that is, can't be touched by death. And all that you saw those few days ago was all leading to this. And you just need to follow him. Because that's, that's where he's going. That's where he's leading you. And when it's all, all darkness and confusion around you. There's only one light that shines in that darkness that you can hold on to and will get you through safely to the other side. So as we come to the end of Mark's Gospel, and there's lots in that last little section but, of chapter 16, but perhaps the real challenge is found in verses 14 and 15 where Jesus rebukes the refusal to believe the eyewitness accounts because these women, and it's not always the women you've noticed, who, they're the ones who hang, they stay there at the cross to the end. They take care of his body 
all that, and then they go to the tomb, everything. So, and not, like, there's no sign of the others, and it's the women who've done that. And then when the women go and they tell, they've got this, this uh, they've seen with their own eyes, he's not there, he's risen, and he was dead, and now he's risen. They go and tell, and, but the people, don't, they, the disciples don't believe them. And Jesus then has to say, look, no, you should have believed their eyewitness accounts. And Jesus rebukes the refusal to believe the eyewitness accounts. And here, Mark has set before us these eyewitness accounts. So what about you? Do you believe this witness to Jesus? Are you on board with it? Because actually, with the way Je cause Jesus rebukes them and then he says, right, Go into the whole world and preach the gospel to every creature. So we actually need you on board with it as we've got to get this out to the whole creation. Every creature. The gospel is going out to the whole creation. And so Mark's like saying, this is, this is the big vision for everything. Jesus being, like take, this good news about him being taken to every creature in the whole creation. Are you on board? Are you going to join us? Or are you going to join us in this mission to the whole creation? Or are you going to draw back? Are you going to be faithless? Are you not going to trust him? Do you trust Jesus, this living God who is the sacrificial lamb, the one who tells us that the way to resurrection glory is through this cross, his cross of the crucified God, that if we would find light and life, we must take up our cross and follow him. Will you follow this Lord Jesus today? You can call out to him because he is a living person. And we meet with him as we read Mark's gospel and all the books in the Bible. We meet with this Lord Jesus. You can read about him, call out to him, take hold of him today. Will you do that? And if we, even if we already have, will we do it afresh today again? We reach out. Call out to Jesus, take hold of him, say, oh, I am on board, I'm in. I want to be part of all this. And we'll be like that centurion who, when he saw this living God die, pour out his life, he said, that's the only God worth bothering with. And this, just to finish with these words from Charles Wesley, endless scenes of wonder rise from that mysterious tree Crucified before our eyes, where we our maker see. Jesus, Lord, what hast thou done? Publish we the death divine. Stop and gaze and fall and own. Was never love like thine. Never love nor sorrow was like that my Saviour showed. See him stretched on yonder cross and crushed beneath our load. Not discern the deity now his heavenly birth declare faith cries out tis he tis he my god that suffers there therefore to god the father god the son and god the holy spirit be ascribed all the praise all the glory all the majesty and all the honor now and forever amen, amen.